Well, back in 84 to 86, I had a two-year research leave from here, and I was at uh, Massachusetts Mental Health Center working on a number of projects. But I was part of a research team um, in psychiatry and law, and uh, it was led by a group of forensic psychiatrists. I had been interested in mental patients' rights. That was a large part of my dissertation research and subsequent research when I started uh, teaching and researching here in 1980. One of the psychiatrists there, Ed Nicholson, had been retained by the lawyers as an expert witness for the Woburn families in the toxic waste case there around childhood leukemia. And every week at the meetings, we would update each other on our work, and one day it was his turn to report on it, uh, and we got into a very interesting discussion. So he was looking uh, at whether or not there was depression and or PTSD as a result of exposure to all the chemicals there. And, you know, it was a very interesting discussion. He asked me, did I know of survey research by sociologists looking at the effects of toxics on communities? Uh, at that point, there was fairly little, but I gave it to him. And, you know, we talked more and more and started to think, hmm, we should write something about this. And next thing I knew, there was a book in the work. So that was how it started. It was just a very intriguing case. These people uh, that we met there had been through an enormous amount, and he had interviewed them already, so he had great uh, entree to them because they trusted him pretty much as a, as a doctor, you know, even though he was getting their uh, information to use in court, they were also, you know, venting to him. And so by the time I got there, I conducted my interviews with him present, although they were all my interviews, and plus we had a lot of access the lawyer, Jan Schlickman, was um, very supportive of the whole project, you know, and he thought it would actually help the case as well, get more information that way, even though I was never working on any retainer for the lawyers. Uh, but, you know, he asked them, please make yourself open to Phil. He's going to come talk to you. It's going to help all of us. And so they were very welcoming. And the more time I spent with them, the more I was completely sucked into this whole new area. I had never done any research in the environment. I had, when I think back to it, you know, I was an inveterate newspaper clipper and I had alphabetical clips of all sorts of things and I did have things on toxic waste and I had remembered, you know, a whole lot of important environmental events that had happened and certainly remember all the political discussions around Earth Day in 1970. Was this the best way to go? Was this taking us away from other things like civil rights, anti-war movement, women's movement? Uh, and people really were having those debates. I don't think we all understood, even in 1970, 40 years ago, how important that Earth Day was. But, you know, it all just sort of gelled together, and I realized that I was now looking at something very similar to what I'd done with mental patients' rights. Dispossessed people with few legal rights, little legal recourse, a little access to power, and a lot of lay people getting signs on their own, really understanding. In the case of Mental patients, they were understanding a lot about the side effects of psychotropics. They were understanding certainly the legal and the policy issues. And the patients' rights activists, you know, had generated a lot of policy changes as well in terms of legal rights for patients who used to have less rights than prisoners. So I saw the same thing happening with all these toxic waste activists. Well, the first thing was they had to even recognize that there was a cluster. And it was very accidental because they met at an oncology clinic down in Boston where their kids were going because there weren't any uh, high-level facilities up in Woburn for them to go to. And so they met in the waiting room and understood there was a cluster. And then they began to ask questions and came up with a lot of obstacles from the State Department of Health, the Department of Public Health, and they didn't get any help from the federal agencies either and they didn't know where to go, so they had to develop a lot of knowledge on their own. And there was a history of concern about water quality there. People could taste and smell it, and there had been a history of complaints to the water department, but nothing ever came of it. So they had a little bit of that to start to piece together, but the main thing was that you know they knew it was a big industrial area, and they knew something was going on, 
and they felt it was very likely connected to the water. So they were invited to give this talk at the Harvard School of Public Health, and uh, Marvin Zellin and Steve Lagakos were sitting in on that talk, um, and they were very, very taken with it, you know, the same way that I was taken with the story when I heard it from Ed Nicholson. Um, Ann Anderson was a co complete grassroots activist, no background in science, no background in politics, but just a good-hearted person. And she was very much like Lois Gibbs, a quiet, ordinary person who, when motivated by kids' health issues and the obstacles that government put in her way and the corporate obstacles, became a tiger and really organized well and went door to door and got people involved. And so, you know, Lugacos and Zellin said, you know, we think that we could do a study to show that a number of health effects, not just leukemia in the children, were associated with water. And we need your help, though, because we don't have any money to do this. We don't have time to write a grant to get that. We have a little bit of money in some account that we could use, you know, but nothing to do a big study. You've got to get a lot of volunteers out there doing these questionnaires with people. And that's, that's what happens. They were able to mobilize a lot of residents and also a number of people who were students and, uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health and other people in various ways were involved doing the, the questions. And they eventually got to around 50% of people with telephone numbers in Woburn, which in those days, I mean, Woburn is a largely working class, lower middle class city. Uh, probably most everybody had a phone. You know, it isn't like today in a very poor area, you don't like to do phone surveys because you know you're going to underrepresent the poorest. And, you know, it was a very large database and it was, you know, statistically strong enough to show the connections between the water from the contaminated sites, uh, from Grace and Beatrice, into the water pipes and to see how they moved into people's homes and what levels of exposure people had and how they clustered in certain neighborhoods. But Ann Anderson was just you know, tremendous as one of endless people that I've studied, uh, many I've met and worked with, but others I've read about and known about through others. No science background, no political background. They just become completely involved because they know no one else will protect our health, our family's health, our surroundings, unless we do it.